Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Café Scientifique. Um, first of all, I'm Roger Whiting. I'm from Altus Therapeutics. We're uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Café Sci, and we're co-sponsors with SRI uh, of Café Sci. And once again, I'd just like to thank uh, SRI for doing such a wonderful job in terms of providing these. How's that? Okay. <laughs> I'll try and do that. <laughs> uh, so Cafe Side provides us with not only the coffee and the biscuits, but also this wonderful facility, and for that I really thank them. Um, yeah, thank you. So after the uh, talk, we'll have discussion, and if you could ask your questions at the microphones, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, also, in between the end of uh, the talk and the discussion, we're going to have the drawing for the Kepler's uh, uh, token. So, oh no! Oh, they closed. You can see that I've not been down there for a while. So anyway, just to introduce uh, Peter Karp, who's uh, director of the Bioinformatics Research Group here at SRI International. And he's um, an expert in terms of metabolic pathway bioinformatics, which sounds uh, uh, quite intimidating and a, a cross between or a combination of uh, biology, chemistry, and computing. And his title is The Holy Grail of Bioinformatics Automatic Construction of Metabolic Models from Sequenced Genomes. So, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. An overview of my talk is that I'm going to give you some background to help you understand the, the problem that I'm going to discuss. Uh, I'm going to tell you what a sequence genome is, what bioinformatics is, what a metabolic model is. And then I'm going to tell you how we computationally infer metabolic, how we computationally infer metabolic models from sequence genomes. And at the same time, I'll give you a a glimpse here and there of some of the software tools that we've developed for representing, exploring, analyzing, visualizing, querying genome information and metabolic pathway information together. And, and overall, the, the, the work that I'll talk about tonight is really work done by tens of different researchers and probably more than a hundred different scientists who contribute to the many different databases used in bioinformatics research. So I played a part in this, but I'm really going to talk about the work of many people. So first of all, what's bioinformatics? Well, uh, you might ask, did you do your PhD in bioinformatics, Peter? And the answer is no, because when I did my PhD, bioinformatics didn't really exist. There were probably 10 bioinformatics researchers uh, back in the 1980s when I did my PhD in computer science at Stanford. Uh, so I couldn't do a PhD in bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field that combines computer science and molecular biology and other areas of biology, as well as some statistics and math. And overall, what's happened in biology over the last 20 years is that biologists have developed these high-throughput experimental technologies like DNA sequencing and gene expression analysis that allow them to generate in a day or a week information that would have taken literally 100 years of, of lab work 10 years previously or 20 years previously. And that's wonderful, but it generates a lot of problems in data analysis and data storage and data retrieval. And so that's where bioinformatics comes in, is that each time the biologists develop a new experiment, high throughput experimental technique, they generate more interesting work for us. So what is a sequence genome? Well, as you all know, DNA is a very long molecule that contains the basic hereditary material of most cells on Earth, from human cells to E. coli cells. And although it's a very complicated molecule, there's a very simple abstraction that can be used to explain it. DNA is a, li a linear chain of four chemical bases that are abbreviated A, C, G, and T. And so the sequence of a DNA molecule is simply the sequence of these chemical subunits that make up that molecule. So you can communicate the sequence of a DNA molecule as a very, very, very long sequence of the letters A, C, G, and T. 
What's the, what is a sequenced genome? Well, an organism's genome is simply the set of DNA molecules present in that organism. So every cell in our body contains, people think, although this may change, more or less the same DNA, complement of DNA. Similarly, an E. coli bacterium or a mycoplasma tuberculosis bacterium also contains a genome, a DNA molecule that defines its hered hereditary material. And so the, g the genome sequence is the sequence of the one or more DNA molecules in a given cell. So for, for e an E. coli bacterium, that DNA sequence is about 4.6 million bases or characters long. It's 4.6 million A's, C's, G's, and T's, one after the other. For the human genome, it's about 3.2 billion bases long. So human genome is about 1,000 times bigger than the E. coli genome. Uh, and here is a wonderful slide that Mickey Cook, a graphic designer here at SRI, did for me. And he tells me that the background here contains about a million A's, C's, G's, and T's. So that's, that's about a quarter of the E. coli genome here on this screen. Um, now, of course, the human genome got a huge amount of press when it was sequenced, but I wonder if people have a sense of how many other genomes have been sequenced to date. Given that the cost of DNA sequencing has been going down tremendously, it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to do the first human genome. Now it costs about $10,000 to do a human genome, uh, probably a bit less. Uh, anybody know roughly how many genomes have been sequenced to date? It's, it's roughly two to 3,000. And some of them are animals. Uh, the chimp's been sequenced. Uh, the cow's been sequenced. A number of plants, which also have large complex genomes, have been sequenced. But most of them are bacteria. At least 2,000 of them are bacteria, which, of course, have much smaller genomes, are much cheaper to sequence. Now, another basic piece of knowledge, of course, is that <clears throat> the DNA contains many genes. Genes are the basic discrete units of heredity. And genes encode proteins. Proteins are really the active molecular machines within a given cell. As I said, DNA sequences are strings over a 40-letter alphabet. That is, their strings or sequences of text over a four-letter alphabet. Proteins are also linear sequences of chemical building blocks, but their strings, they're basically 20 chemical building blocks of proteins. So you can think of proteins as strings over a 20-letter alphabet that denote the amino acid building blocks of proteins. And the genetic code, a very basic scientific discovery made back in the 50s, was that um, triplets of these A's, C's, G's, and T's within the DNA, within a given gene, encode individual amino acids that, within a protein. So we kind of read DNA three bases at a time to translate them to their protein, to pr translate a codon, a sequence of three bases, to its amino acid equivalent. Now, in, in formulating this overall talk and my total, title and so forth, it, it came from a realization I had a few months ago, which I want to try to describe. Um, if you, I've spent some time reading some of the early publications from the 80s and the 90s when the human genome was first being formulated, and it's, it's kind of remarkable how vague those initial formulations of the Human Genome Project were in the sense that people were, people were pretty unclear about what we would learn from the sequence after we had it, uh, how would we learn that, how long would it take for us to learn, for example, to find the genes within the human genome. For example, the genes in the human genome constitute about 1.5 percent of the DNA sequence in the human genome. In other words, the genes are like little islands separated by long stretches of non-coding DNA, although they're more tightly packed in bacteria. So how would, how would we even find these genes? How would we find where they are? Uh, so you're, basically, the problem is you're given 300 million, or, or 3 billion in the case of, of humans, you're given 3 billion A, C's, G's, and, and T's in a row. Um, how do, you, how do you decode that, that encrypted message and find where the genes are and what they do? No, nobody even hazarded a guess back in the 80s and 90s as to what fraction of the human genes we would find. 
Or how would we predict the functions of these genes? How do we know when we found a given gene what its biological function was? Would it code for the protein hemoglobin, which makes our blood red? Would it code for eye color or hair color? Would it affect our development? Uh, and no one even took a guess as to what fraction of genes we would, we would be able to predict functions for. Now, today we can predict functions for about half of bacterial genes. Uh, and in fact, one of the papers I read suggested that it would only be through experimentation that we'd be able to determine the functions of, of genes. So, so part of the genome analysis problem is finding where the genes are and what the genes do. I also talked about the, the notion of a metabolic model. Let me, let me explain what I mean by a metabolic model. So here's a little background about metabolism. Um, now, one way to think about a cell is that it's, it's really a self-replicating machine. It's a machine that you put it out in the wild and wait a little while and you have two of them and four of them and eight of them. You know, we have a great electronics industry here in Silicon Valley, a lot of ingenious people, but I don't know of anybody who's developed a machine that you throw it out into a pond of muck and it makes two of itself. Okay, so this is, a, this is a pretty ingenious device. And the way cells do that is they take in chemicals from their environment. They have little pumps in their surface called transporters that pump chemicals that the cell likes into the interior of the cell. And then cells contain a little biochemical plant inside that transforms those chemicals into the building blocks of the cell itself. Uh, and so there's a whole sequence of chemical reactions that perform these conversions. And one thing they convert these chemicals into are the building blocks of the cell's membrane. As the cell grows, it needs to make more of its membrane. It needs to make copies of its DNA. So these chemicals are also converted into the building blocks of DNA and into the amino acid building blocks of proteins. And because these chemical reactions occur too slowly based on normal unassisted chemistry, the cell makes enzymes, proteins, that accelerate each one of these roughly thousand biochemical reactions that occur in E. coli. And each enzyme is encoded by a, a gene in the cell's genome. And the metabolism, or the set of metabolic reactions going on within a cell, is the set of cellular chemical reactions. So what's a metabolic model? Well, a metabolic model is a quantitative description, a mathematical description of the metabolic reactions going on within the cell. And metabolic models let us predict the rates of these chemical reactions in different situations in order to make different kinds of predictions. So there are a number of applications of metabolic models. One is to try to figure out how to grow bacteria that we get, don't currently know how to grow. One, one of the fascinating things about microbiology is that most of the bacteria that exist on Earth, scientists don't know how to grow them. They can only grow about 5% of bacteria that exist on the planet. The others, you put them in a petri dish and give them chemicals that you think they'd be happy with and they don't grow. So can we use a metabolic model to predict what sets of nutrients would support the growth of these uncultural bacteria because it turns out we can sequence the DNA of these uncultural bacteria. So can we go from the DNA to a metabolic model to a prediction of what will make the cells grow? Here's another problem is using metabolic models to assist antibacterial drug design because when people design drugs to kill disease-causing bacteria, what they want to do is find a small molecule that will get into the cell bind to one of these enzymes or other cellular proteins and prevent them from, from working, inhibit them, and essentially stop one of these reactions from being accelerated in the cell. And so one way you can predict, so, the, so what you'd like to predict is which of these enzymes are essential. Because some of these enzymes, if you knock them out, there's another path through the network that will take you from the input compounds to the essential compounds that the cell needs to make. But some of these enzymes, if you knock them out, the cell can't grow. So what you do is you run your metabolic model with, in the case of E. coli, you run it 4,000 times with every possible gene removed from the model, and you see if the cell can grow. 
Now another application of these models is in biofuels production. Let's say you're a, a biofuels company and you want to engineer E. coli or yeast or some other bacterium microorganism to, to produce biofuels. Typically what, what you want to do is insert new genes into the genome that code for enzymes that the organism doesn't have that add on additional reactions that make a fuel compound from some input like, um, like agricultural waste or carbohydrate breakdown products of agricultural waste. And metabolic models will help you not only figure out which enzymes to add, but how can you optimize the overall structure of the network to produce optimal amounts of the fuel. So the cell puts all its energy, most of its energy, into making fuels and not more of itself. Now overall, what's, what's been shown in the last few years is that by chaining together different sets of bioinformatics programs, it's possible to automatically infer quantitative metabolic models from a sequenced genome. And there was a publication a, a couple years ago that showed that these automatically generated models have about a 60% accuracy in predicting growth or no growth under the cell, of the cell under different nutrient conditions. Sorry, there's my break program kicking in. In other words, you can computationally simulate supplying different combinations of chemicals as the inputs to the cell and then ask with these models, will the cell grow or not? You can also, as I mentioned earlier, simulate removal of different or inactivation of different genes and ask, again, predict does the cell grow or not under different nutrient conditions. And one group showed about 60% accuracy in these two different tasks. And that's using a purely automated uh, pipeline. Um, you know, one of the things about computer scientists is that we're incredibly lazy. We really would much rather have the computer do our work for us, and we're willing to spend, you know, weeks and weeks of programming to save five minutes of manual labor. Um, <laughs> but, but when you're dealing with thousands of genomes, you actually do need to have it as automated as possible. Because if you need a person in the loop to do that analysis, uh, over thousands of genomes, it's, it's going to take an incredibly long time. So this notion of purely, you push a button and you go from a genome sequence to a metabolic model, uh, that, that's the accomplishment that I'm talking about. And, you know, just writing programs that find genes and predict their functions is a really hard problem. Making these programs automated is a really hard problem. And back in the 80s and the 90s, when the Human Genome Project was first formulated, uh, that, that alone was viewed as a very hard problem. And back in those days, no one would have dared to propose the challenge that we automatically generate a metabolic model from a genome sequence. And what I realized a few months ago is, wow, we've actually succeeded in uh, achieving what could have been put forward as a holy grail back in those days, but I don't think anybody dared to, to do it. So we've actually achieved this holy grail without even proposing it. 